take your Bibles once more and turn in the Old Testament to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 16 is where we pick up this morning. Deuteronomy 16, we'll have before us this morning, God willing, the entire chapter. And so once more, I want to remind you that this is God's Word. So let us give our attention to its reading. Observe the month of Abib, and keep the Passover to the Lord your God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. And you shall offer the Passover sacrifice to the Lord your God from the flock or the herd at the place where the Lord will choose to make his name dwell there. You shall eat no unleavened, no, no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat it with unleavened bread, the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, that all the days of your life you may remember the day when you came out of the land of Egypt. No leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory for seven days. Nor shall any of the flesh that you sacrifice on the evening of the first day remain all night until morning. You may not offer the Passover sacrifice within any of your towns that the Lord your God has given you, but at the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell in it. There you shall offer the, sacrifice, the Passover sacrifice in the evening at sunset at the time you came out of Egypt. And you shall cook it and eat it at the place that the Lord your God will choose. And in the morning you shall turn and go to your tents. For six days you shall eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day there shall be a solemn assembly to the Lord your God. You shall do no work on it. You shall count seven weeks. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time the sickle is first put into the standing grain. Then you shall keep the feast of weeks to the Lord your God with the tribute of a free will offering from your hand, which you shall give as the Lord your God blesses you. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite who is within, within your towns, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are among you, at the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there. You shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and you shall be careful to observe these statutes. You shall keep the Feast of Booths seven days, when you have gathered in the produce from your threshing floor and your wine press. You shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your towns. For seven days you shall keep the feast to the Lord your God, at the place that the Lord will choose, because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands, so that you will be altogether joyful. Three times a year all your males shall appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose. At the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Booths. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given you. You shall appoint judges and officers in all your towns the Lord your God has given you according to your tribes. And they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality. And you shall not accept a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of the righteous. Justice, and only justice, you shall follow. That you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not plant any tree as an Asherah beside the altar of the Lord your God that you shall make. And you shall not set up a pillar which the Lord your God hates. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we continue our way through the book of Deuteronomy, I want to remind you, and for those who haven't been with us, to explain to you that Moses is giving a set of instructions to the people of Israel before they go into the promised land. So these are Moses' last words. And as a good pastor, the last words of Moses are a, re a reminder of what he had already told them. Deuteronomy is a summary in many ways of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Bringing together those teachings about sacrifices, about elders, about all of those laws even that God had given 
And loosely understood, Deuteronomy really is outlined according to the Ten Commandments. And we've been tracking our way through this ever since chapter 5. In chapter 5, the commandments are given. And from there, we looked at an application, several applications, of the first commandment, of the second commandment, and the third commandment. And we began last time, two weeks ago, to look at the fourth commandment. And that continues in our text today, even as it makes a transition to the fifth commandment. And I thought about sort of making a hard stop with the end of the fourth commandment exposition. But you'll notice that at the end of Deuteronomy 16, Moses returns to the issue of worship. And so there, the elders are being spoken of, but it's not out of the context of worship. For all the commandments are connected. It's not as though you can take a, a, a surgical knife and remove one of the commandments cleanly out and say, we have kept everything else intact. For after all, James tells us to break the law at any one point is to be guilty of breaking all of it. Okay? And so as we went through and, and began our look at the fourth commandment last time, we noted the principle of Sabbath as rest. In slavery and bondage in Egypt, Israel knew no rest, but God redeemed them and gave them rest. This was uh, to work its way throughout the community we saw. There was the weekly Sabbath, but also the year-long Sabbath, the labor Sabbath, when when servants were released and the offerings that they would give on the Sabbath. We noted then that the Sabbath principle of rest is grounded, it is rooted in creation as God himself rested on the seventh day from all of his labors. And we note in the New Testament that the author of Hebrews reminds us that we are still waiting for that ultimate final Sabbath rest. That while Christ is our Sabbath, he has, he has obtained rest for us. The truth is that we are still waiting. There's an already but not yet that runs throughout our redemption. Christ is our Sabbath, but as the author of Hebrews reminds us, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And so as we continue our study of the fourth commandment, we know today is the centrality of worship in the people of God or among the people of God. But one other thing that is added to that in this chapter is this interesting principle of the people having to travel to a particular place for worship. Now, undoubtedly, we all know that there is no longer sort of a requirement that you have to go to a particular place a particular city, a particular state or nation, some particular spot in the world that you go to that is somehow more holy than the rest of the world. But I think there's a different principle that underlies this chapter. Just as rest is a Sabbath principle, when we think about worship also, the idea that we are a pilgrim people is a principle that undergirds our worship. This is why, as we've noted in past weeks, that worship is an interruption in our lives. It is not something that we simply kind of do as we go along throughout our life. We have to plan. We have to gather. We have to carve out the time. And we do it each week. Now, interestingly, they had the Sabbath worship in the Old Testament where they would gather together. And then, of course, there was the morning and evening sacrifices. But three times a year... The men were called to appear before God at the place where he would make his name to dwell. And the principle I believe that this shows us is that understanding that their lives were always this kind of unsettled life. Even in the promised land, they would have to make these journeys. Now, you might not think much about it because we just read through the Old Testament and we kind of get through it and we move on. But, but really think about this. If you lived, let's say, a hundred miles from Jerusalem, and you had to hike your way there, or maybe you had an animal, and you would often bring your family, and then you would travel. Now, you have a farm, you have a, a whole bunch of things to take care of at home, but you're going to be gone for probably the better part of five weeks between traveling and worship. Okay? Okay. 
And you do that three times a year. You already start to add up the math and everybody starts to get a little nervous. <laughs> How do you ever get ahead if that's what you do? But that was kind of the point. It was meant to be this interruption to remind Israel, even there in the promised land, that they were waiting, they were longing, they were a pilgrim people. And that's what I want us to see in the text today as we work our way through it. So let's begin with the instructions concerning Passover. It says, observe the month of Abib and keep the Passover there just in verse 1. We see first that worship was, as I said already, to set the rhythm of Israel's life. The weekly Sabbath, as well as the, the, the feasts that were, that were centered upon uh, God's recreative work. So we can say that worship is grounded in creation and recreation. But central to the mighty acts of God in the Old Testament is the Passover. It was the Passover that had set apart this nation as God's peculiar people. While the promises stretched back all the way to Abraham and to the garden before him, we see that God worked in history to deliver his people from bondage to slavery. The event was so significant that it rewrote Israel's calendar. Before the institution of the Passover, the year had begun in the fall, in the month Tishri. But following God's mighty act of exodus and deliverance, Israel's calendar began on the first day of Abib. And so here we see first that worship was to reorder their affairs. To reorder their life. It's interesting, right? God doesn't say to simply make room for worship. But rather, that our lives are ordered around God's worship. After all, that's why at the beginning of every worship service, what do we have? We have a call to worship. And by the way, nothing in our worship service is sort of just thrown in haphazardly. Everything is thought through. Everything is grounded in Scripture. And we don't dare approach God without Him calling us to Himself. And so we have this call to worship reminding us that we are to lay aside all of the earthly cares that, 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 will, that will flood our minds if we are not careful. I know I could say just the right or wrong phrase and your mind will be gone. You'll be racing through everything that's going on this week. Everything that's in the news. Everything that runs across your Facebook feed. But worship is to be centered upon the triune God. He is the one who commands Israel. He is the one who commands our attention. And so Israel rewrites their calendar. And it begins with this mighty act of God. And then it goes on and it talks about this feast that was tied to the Passover. It was the feast of unleavened bread. It was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. For seven days, they had to sort of put leaven out of their house. They, they couldn't even have it in the board. Like, they had to just get rid of it. They had to just expel it from their home. And it was, it was several reasons for it. One, of course, was because they ate the Passover meal in haste. Remember, God comes to Moses and he says, I'm going to send the angel of death over Egypt. And it's going to kill every firstborn. But you, you're, you are my people, you're going to have a Passover lamb. That's that sort of the idea of Passover. The angel of death passes over and doesn't strike their homes. And remember what they had to do. They had to take that lamb into their home. They had to slaughter that lamb. They had to take the blood of the lamb and they had to put it on the doorpost and on the sides of the door. And then they had to eat the bread in haste because they had to leave. They had to get out. And so God prepared them and called them. And so this bread, it, it signified sort of the, the, the way in which they had to leave quickly. But it also signified the affliction. It's called the bread of affliction. And I take that maybe to, maybe to mean that unleavened bread is not necessarily the tastiest of bread. And so in eating it, it was a reminder of sort of the hardness of their life before the reality of the suffering and the sorrow. And then later, leaven would come to have the significance of, of being seen as representative of sin. 
After all, Paul talks about how a little bit of leaven works through the whole lump. And there he's talking about how sin works through a church. So all of this taken together, they were to move the leaven out of their homes. And they were to simply remember what God himself had done. They were to remember that they were a people in affliction. They were to remember that God had brought them out through the blood of the Lamb. Unless we think this is just an interesting Old Testament story. Much the way that some scholars think of John chapter 9 as an interesting New Testament story. We want to affirm the truthfulness of it, but also the significance of it for us. And the Apostle Paul is very helpful in this regard. He says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. Here it is. God's word calls you a lump. As you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. See, this holiday that was celebrated in the Old Testament around which Israel would begin their year, their year and around which Israel would order their lives, we likewise are called to order our lives, but it's around Christ because this Passover feast points to Christ because He's the true Passover Lamb. Remember what, what John the Baptist says when he sees Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so Jesus is our Passover lamb, beloved. It is on the basis of His blood that is shed. It is our being united to Him, our being, 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 being uh, uh, sprinkled clean with His blood. That means that death, when it does come, it cannot harm. Death, when it does come, cannot separate us from God. Indeed, Jesus' death on the cross, our Passover lamb, transforms death completely. And now it is being ushered into the presence of God. It is beholding our Savior face to face. And so God gives to Israel in the Old Testament this, this type, this, this shadow, this, this, this pointer. to would remind them and point them forward. And so it was to be kept. It was to be kept year after year after year after year because, because Israel needed to be reminded of where they had come from and ultimately that they did not belong to this world. And together with this was this solemn assembly. And so they would have a solemn assembly. And you'll notice that it's repeated over and over and over again. At the place. At the place. The Passover itself as a sacrifice and was tied to the place where the Lord would instruct them to go. It was not a matter of a personal moment with God alone in their home. It was a community meal, a community time. Worshippers gathering together. Yes, one lamb per household, but together. In this way, the Apostle Paul will actually draw on this for the Lord's Supper in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which we'll hear as we come to the table, we are reminded of the fact that this is a communal meal. That we gather together each week to worship our God together in spirit and in truth. And to partake of the supper. Just as in the Old Testament, our lives have been reordered. Because we have been made new. We no longer belong to ourselves. And we certainly don't belong to this fallen world. But we belong both to our Savior and to the world that is to come. And our worship every week is a breaking in of that reality. So we see here, first of all, the instructions concerning Passover. I know I've sort of gotten a little bit ahead of myself in my notes. But I want us to focus on a couple of things briefly before we move on to our, our, our shorter second point. And it's this, that, that, that God's Word throughout the Old Testament and the New gives us instructions for our worship, as we've noted already. And so here we see that, that true worship, it involves an engagement with God and a focus on Him. This is one of the reasons why we, we sort of reject the notion of seeker-sensitive worship models. Those models that became so popular through the 1980s as a way to figure out how to draw as many people as possible. And no, I'm not saying we don't want to draw as many people as possible. 
But the seeker-sensitive model went to the point of, of, of trying to figure out what kind of bait each person would take in order to draw them in. Oh, we believe in another seeker-sensitive model. Remember, it is God Himself who is seeking those who will worship Him. And so we are sensitive to His command and to His Word. And so not only does worship involve an engagement with God and a focus on Him, and it is at His invitation, but it is, it is on His terms. Notice here in Deuteronomy 16 that God's people were not free to simply say, well, I know the Lord said at the place, but I think I'd rather stay here. I think I'd rather have leavened bread rather than unleavened bread. No, when God gave explicit commands to Israel how they were to worship, that was how they were to worship. And thirdly, we know that this is something I've already tried to say toward the end of the first point is that our worship is communal. And that bears repeating. It bears repeating that our worship is done together. And that's not to say that you can't have private worship. Indeed, you should have private worship. And that's not to say that you can't have family worship. Indeed, you should have family worship because just as the Lord's Day and our corporate worship orders our day, so are our week, so also our private and family worship can order our days. And I know, I get, I, I understand the reason why people don't have those things. It tends to be because they are hard to start and there are so many things that get in the way. But remember, that's kind of the point. Our worship should get in the way. It should be a moment where we pause to remember that we do not belong to this world. And that brings us then to our second point. And again, this will be quick because I've already covered much of this. But it's in the context of the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of Booths. Because these are the three feasts that Israel was to go and to appear before God. And they were to appear before Him at the place. And in case you're curious, Psalms 120 to 134, the Psalms of Ascent, are believed to be psalms that would be sung as they would make that journey. They would sing those pilgrim psalms as they would wind their way through roads and various places, trusting the Lord. But we see here first that these one, the, the second of these feasts, first is the Passover unleavened bread. Second here we see the, uh, the Feast of Weeks, the celebration of the wheat harvest. It, 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 in a way it points to God's provision. And the Greek name for this festival is Pentecost. It means 50 days. It was celebrated 50 days after the Passover, which was actually when Israel came to Sinai and heard the law of God. There the fire fell and the wind sounded and the people trembled. And we note here the way in which they were called to celebrate. They were to celebrate in rejoicing. They were to celebrate in giving. It says that they were to give a free will offering. We've talked before about Israel's sort of, sort of plan of giving and how much they would give to the Lord. They would give as God had blessed them, as God had provided for them, so they would give. I'm reminded of, of when David, when King David would, 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 would purchase uh, 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 the plot from, uh, from, from uh, uh, Arowana, uh, the one who owned the plot where the temple would be. Remember, it's in 2 Samuel 24, when David stands before the angel of death in order to stop the plague that is coming upon the people. And there he wants to buy the plot, and he wants to, because, because there he will, he will offer burnt offerings. And everyone else tells him, no, 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 you, 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 you just take it. King David said, I will, I, will, I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. That passage always sticks out to me when I think about Deuteronomy 16 and the fact that they're told not to appear before the Lord empty-handed, but to bring a free will offering, to bring a tribute. Because our worship is costly to appear before the Lord. We bring gifts. We bring praise. They are to rejoice. We see there in verse 11. There you, you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. For all the jokes that are made about Presbyterian worship and joy. Let's hope that we truly do rejoice. 
that the, the reality of the redemption of our, from our sins is something that brings us great joy. The fact that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord is a, is, is a matter of joy for us. The fact that once we were lost, but now we are found, is a matter of joy. Because look there in verse 12, you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt. You see, that's connected there to their joy. To remember what it was that God had done. This was this, this 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 festival was not simply about harvest. It was about God's harvest. It was about how God had brought them out as the first fruit of the harvest He had promised. The redemption of His people. Fifty days after Israel was brought out of Egypt, they would be at Sinai and they would see God appear in fire and in the sound of thunder. It's not without significance that it was 50 days after Jesus' New Testament exodus on the cross, His resurrection from the dead, we find the disciples gathered together on Pentecost, experiencing the presence of God through fire and the sound of wind once more. There's so much to be said about that, but we'll press on. Because we have a third feast, the Feast of Booths. It's also often referred to as the Feast of Ingathering. And this would be a feast that occurred in September, October. And it focuses on the harvest of the summer fruits. We read in verse 13, You shall keep the Feast of Booths seven days when you have gathered in the produce from your threshing floor and your wine press. There are similarities to the Feast of Weeks, right? They are to rejoice in their feast. It is to last seven days. It is to be a moment to remember what God had done. That He was the one who blessed them. Right? God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands. So that you will be altogether joyful. The center of this worship, this pilgrim worship, was to be a rejoicing in the redemption that the Lord has, had worked. As well as the provision that He had given. And they were to give out of that gratitude. And to give thanks and to praise the Lord. As I said, this was to take place three times throughout the year. It's there, verses 16 and 17, highlighting again the reality that, that, that it is a pilgrim kind of worship. One New Testament scholar puts it this way. The basic point of the comparison is that now, as well as then, the people of God are a pilgrim people. In New Testament times, as well as in the Old Testament, God's people are wayfarers. That is our basic identity as Christians. We are people on the way. And that means further that those on this pilgrimage are exposed to all kinds of difficulties and hardship. And all of that hardship tends toward an ultimate temptation. The temptation to give up, to abandon our confession, rather than hold fast to our confession as the author of Hebrews in chapter 4 tells us. This is why it is so necessary for the scriptures to admonish us to hold fast to Christ. You see, beloved, our worship is focused upon the glory that is to come because that is our true identity. Because we are, yes, citizens of two kingdoms, but our citizenship, Paul says, is in heaven. And from there we await our Savior. And let me just say, as an aside, that if your blood boils a little too hot during the week, it might be because you have forgotten at times the reality that you are a pilgrim in this world. And each Lord's Day is a, an opportunity to be reminded of it. We belong to the world that is to come. This is how Paul says it in Colossians 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. In Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. You know, I can already hear the objections. I can already hear that that's so naive. We're missing the opportunity to transform the world. And yet we don't see a command in Scripture to do that. We see a command in Scripture 
the church to make disciples. To make disciples of all nations, of all peoples. We see clearly the call to us that we are to gather and to worship our God. We see clearly that we are waiting for a new creation, a new, a, a, a true, sinless world. And God's people throughout history and around the world right now continue to wait. And I understand that being a pilgrim is not comfortable. It's not. It's easier to put down our roots. It's easier to become identified with all of the battles that this world is going through. But that is not our call as believers. Our worship reminds us that we are not of this world. In our text then there's a transition as I said, but it's only a partial transition because the commandments are connected and God has appointed people who will be able to oversee the worship of his, of his people. And that's where I see the connection here as a transition to the fifth commandment. And this isn't the end of the fifth commandment, so we're going to spend more time on this next week. So we can just briefly look over these verses. You shall appoint judges and officers in all your towns that the Lord your God has given you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. I'll say more about where elders come from next week in Exodus chapter 18. But note here the importance of appointing these elders. Right here with the discussion of worship. Right after the discussion of not taking the Lord's name in vain. And worshiping properly. And having no other God besides the Lord. We find the fifth commandment. This commandment that turns our attention perhaps from looking upward to looking around. But nevertheless it's not disconnected. I mean, after all, as we already noted as we came into worship, whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. But I think there's actually a clearer point being made. Because the elders are those who would be appointed, yes, to uphold justice, but also with upholding faithful worship. And here in this text we find the primary duties of our ruling elders within our church. You see, they are appointed for the sake of justice. They are appointed for the cases of discipline. They are appointed so that God's people would be protected. That is absolutely one of the purposes of elders. But another purpose is to oversee the worship. To oversee the worship of God's people. Now that's not to say that they're looking around and keeping an eye on you and taking notes. Actually, they're keeping an eye on me. And taking note. Because throughout church history, beloved, you must know this. It's not as though the greatest heresy and problems of the church has arisen from where you sit. But from where I stand. From the, from the point of proclamation. And that is why in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church we take such great strides to, to ensure that our ministers are taught. And that they can understand that they can exegete scripture. That they have a sound theology. That they understand to point people to Jesus Christ. And yes, you'll find different flavors of that throughout the OPC. But, we stand before a presbytery. We're examined for hours. For days even. I mean, not on the floor of presbytery. But certainly in committees and in written exams. And that's after seminary. You see, it's important because worship is vital to God's people. Because the preaching of God's word will lead people closer to him or away from him. Now this is true in Old Testament Israel. We can't fill out the whole picture. But I promise you as we were to go through the Old Testament, we would see that it was actually the elders who would go astray. It was actually the teachers who would go astray. And they would lead the people astray. They would turn away from the, the call that God had given to them in Ezekiel 34. And they would begin to feed upon the people themselves. Rather than looking to the Lord, they looked to their own self-interest. Rather than building the house of God, they wanted to line their own pockets. And as you look around at the church in our own culture, you can say, not a lot has changed. There are still those dangers. And so we need faithful elders. 
We need faithful elders. The connection to worship is right there before us in verses 21-22. You shall not plant any tree as an Asherah beside the altar of the Lord your God that you shall make. And you shall not set up a pillar which the Lord your God hates. This isn't about gardens and architecture. This is specifically about points of worship. The Asherah and the pillar, they were parts of Baal worship, pagan worship, idolatry. And so they were told that they were to keep them out. And in some sense, we can say that the elders were given a very short, clear list of the things to avoid. They were to watch for justice, and they were to protect worship. And actually, these things, again, are not completely disconnected. We find them together in the book of James, interestingly enough. I was reflecting on James as I worked through Deuteronomy 16. You see, here in, 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 uh, in chapter 16, Moses says, You shall not pervert justice, you shall not show partiality, you shall not accept a bribe. And in James chapter 2, he says, My brother, show no partiality as you hold faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears fine clothing and say, You sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, You stand over there, or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? You see, here in James, he's picking up on this understanding of elders because he's writing to elders. He's picking up on this understanding of elders in order to protect the people, to not show partiality. For partiality is an affront to God's holiness as well as the redemption that he works. Because, beloved, to look at yourself and to see anything besides someone who is a sinner redeemed by grace is to misunderstand who you are outside of Christ. Paul will write elsewhere, Consider your calling, my brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that, no human being might boast in the presence of God. There's a clear lesson here in Deuteronomy 16. When we think about the role of elders, whether with regard to worship or with regard to justice, authority is given for the sake of others. This is true ideally in the world, but it is especially true in the church and in Christian families. The perversion of, ju of, of justice is the destruction of what God has called his leaders to. It is the destruction of what God has called husbands and fathers to be. It is the destruction of what God has called elders in the church to be. Injustice is something that grieves the heart. It is something that God abhors. And so we are to have elders who walk in justice, who are sure not to show partiality, who are sure to care for all who are under their care. And here, beloved, we come to the end of our study then. You see, it says, justice and only justice you shall follow that you may live and inherit the land the Lord your God has given you. This points us back to the fifth commandment. Right, that your days may be long, and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. But justice here is the word for righteousness, the moral righteousness of God that is revealed in His laws. We know the problems with injustice, especially when it touches our own lives. But our world is full of injustice. Israel is warned against this, but their sin drove them much the way sin drives our world today. The answer to this is always going to be Jesus. Because, beloved, what we need is one who is, both the the, who is both just and the justified. We need one who redeems us because we in ourselves deserve nothing but judgment. And as pilgrims in this world, this is our message 
And this continues to be and will continue to be our message in this world, this side of glory. J. Gerson Machen, in his essay, The Responsibility of the Church in the New Age, he says, The responsibility of the church in the New Age is the same as this responsibility in every age. It is to testify that this world is lost in sin, that the span of human life, nay, all the length of human history, is an infinitesimal island in the awful depths of eternity. That there is a mysterious, holy, living God, creator of all, upholder of all, infinitely beyond all, that he has revealed himself to us in his word and offered us communion with himself through Jesus Christ the Lord. That there is no other salvation for individuals or for nations save this. But that this salvation is full and free. And that whosoever possesses it has for himself and for all others to whom he may be the instrument of bringing it. A treasure compared with which all the kingdoms of the earth, nay, all the wonders of the starry heavens are as the dust of the street. Beloved, we are pilgrims in this world. And this worship each week reminds us of that reality. But let us not think for a moment that being pilgrims means that we are poor. For we have treasure in heaven and we wait for our redeemer.